of the ashes The spirits light up the night Looking down the edge of forever So stop me and take my advice Now, from the Untold Radio Network It's Untold Radio AM With Doug and Alex Hijack Hey guys. Hey Alex. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Six days till Halloween. Your favorite holiday? No. <laughs> no, because you know what I do? I stick all the junk in a candy in a bowl. Huge bowl. I don't want to get up every two seconds. And then now some kid comes along and dumps the whole bowl in this bag and runs away or takes a whole damn bowl and runs down the street and the ditches. I find the bowl down the block. How long does that last? I mean, it's a big, you know, it's a big bowl. Yeah. yeah. Is it well, the first kid or the okay, second kid? Okay, but usually a kid comes and wrecks yeah. it for Empties everybody. It. Empties it out. Oh, yeah. He steals but it. But you got a ring camera now so you can yell at him. Yeah, but I I think the revenge is he's going to get a damn big stomach ache. Oh, yeah. So that's my revenge. I don't really care. <laughs> you know, meat candy's not cheap. Holy crap. And oh, there's man. deflation. Like I was looking at um, some caramels. Oh, and I should have sent you that too because your your sister, she's like, Dad, let's, let's make our own caramel, right? Yeah, should, I gotta send this to you. I still have to find it. Uh, I have to because somebody had then posted on Reddit that they were making homemade caramel and it exploded all over their kitchen, and they had the photos and video to prove it. And could you imagine cleaning? You thought hard-boiled eggs were bad. Could you imagine sticky caramel all over your textured ceiling, all over the walls, everywhere? Oh no! I would just move out. I would just sell the house and just. And when guys like paint over it, just paint over the car. <laughs> just, just paint over it. Anyhow, I see John Ayers goes. Oh, I was four minutes late because I was getting purple crap. Actually, no, I was getting root beer. <laughs> Took a while. Anyhow, but uh, what else we got going on? So. Um, we have a really cool guest, David Wilbanks tonight. I've not yep. met David, but I I know he's cool because oh yeah, he's awesome. I know I know he is. You know, he was in Bigfootville. He was. Did you ever see you? He was a little. He said <laughs> you never saw Bigfootville. I guarantee you. <laughs> You're so. Well, what, what it was that? A, what was that? But a, I was did. That it was on the Travel Channel for years. They played it. Years and years and years, like every round, every Halloween. They probably still are to this day playing Bigfootville. He's in that show. Oh, perfect. Yeah. So you, so you know him. Well, I no, I don't. You know of him. Well, I know he was in Bigfootville. <laughs> I watched it a bunch of times. Anyhow, um, but he is, um, he wrote a book, and I got him on a butcher this. Is it Kamachi? Kayamachi? It... It's a native First Nations name. Yeah, Kimachi. <laughs> no, I think it's Kimachi <laughs> um, Bigfoot yeah. investigating yeah. the Oklahoma Sasquatch. Yeah. Yeah, that's coming up. Yeah. Bottom of the hour. But um, we should. Um... Oh, there it is. So it's Kayamachi, I think. Kimachi. Yeah, well, he'll, he'll teach us. Yeah, he probably ways. doesn't know either. <laughs> Nobody knows. Oh, my God. I was looking at a sign. There was an Ojibwe sign for a gas station up in Cloquet here the other day. Mm. And I mean the name. I swear to God, you, is probably, I'm not exaggerating, probably 50 characters long, the name. 50, 50 characters. Yeah. That, I mean, how would you be like up, down? I mean, you'd be, you'd be all day trying to pronounce that name. It's crazy. So Uncle Bone says it's Kiamachi. Kiamichi. There you go. That sounds right, actually. Kiamichi. 
Yeah. Uh, other you one. guys are doing better than the both of us. Yeah, I know. Thank you. Oh, and then somebody from, uh, I think it's Abe, goes, that's correct. <laughs> like you would know, Abe. <laughs> like you would know. Uh, so what do we got here? Um, by the way, I got to hang out with Joel. Remember Joel Sturgis? Yeah. You replaced. Thinking... Anyhow, I got to hang out with Joel. It was fun. Yeah, you guys get caught up. Yeah, we did. No, we hung out the uh, whole weekend, actually. Nice. Yep. Oh my God, you wouldn't believe this. Once again, user session has expired. Apparently, the show is over. Oh, we're done, guys. We're done. I got a lot. I got to do. I just, why does this happen to me? We worked so hard today, even to get the internet, the quickest. I have the fastest internet on the planet. On the West. On the, on the whole planet, I believe. On the whole entire world. I think so. Oh my gosh, if y'all hear me sh- typing, here we go again. Clicking and clacking, guys. Apparently, my just thing runs out exactly during the show. Let's see if I can get a login first. Yeah, first time, man. I did it. There we go. Bang Back on. to normal. Okay, what do we got going on? Um, Some headlines, nothing too exciting. U.S. government released a new big, big new update on UFO investigation. That they're apparently just conducting. Wink, wink, wink. Wink, 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 huh? Wink, 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 yes. It says the Department of Defense recently released its annual report. Apparently there's an annual report now. I didn't know that. It's annual. An unidentified anomalous whatever. I can't even see it. Hold on here. Now that I had to reboot, all my windows got messed up. Of course they did now. Just hang on. Oh, my God. And you know what it did? It reverted back to that thing where you got to have your email about 14 million miles wide. Oh, no. Okay, here we go. Starting over. Starting over. Um, Apparently, okay, they released their annual report, right? Apparently, UFOs, they're no longer dismissed as a result of hyperactive hyperactive imaginations of someone who watched Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters. They just got to get that dig in. They, they got to just say they something gotta nasty. got to say something stupid every time. Okay. This comes after former U.S. intelligence officer and whistleblower David... Um, uh, Gersh told News Nation in June that UFOs are real and that the U.S. government has in its possession, you know, these crashed objects, apparently 12 of them. Anyhow, so they testified, but now they got the big committee and everything. But here's here's where it gets just sad. So the bottom line in this annual report, right? Mm. We got to hear this. Bottom line that the team did not find any evidence None, zero, that UAPs are extraterrestrial. None. Really? No evidence. None, zero. But I love this one. But they added this caveat. But we don't know what they are. <laughs> so how does that go together? You know, that's like, yeah. you know, vinegar and water. We don't know what they are, but they're not extraterrestrial. So they're basically, uh, their conclusions mean we're moving on. That's, that's enough too, of that too crap. Bad. Yeah. But you're not surprised, are you? No, it's just, it's exactly what you expect. I was getting my hopes up. Yeah. Nope. We no proof, nothing, nothing to see here, folks. Go home. But we don't know what they are, but. So we're going to go from space to catfish. Have you heard about the new zombie catfish that are all over? Zombie, Zombie catfish. catfish. And you know, catfish get pretty big. So apparently, and I looked into this, there is a bacteria that's eating all of their flesh off. So I don't recommend you don't look it up unless you want to get really grossed out what these zombie yeah. catfish look like. But it's really sad. I couldn't imagine being alive, like a, trying to make a living at the bottom of a river and having all your flesh gone. It's really ugly. It's brutal. And so, so it's apparently catfish afflicted with this bacterial infection. 
It makes their skin appear it's melting, according to Georgia Department of Natural Resources. The infection is known as hole in the head disease. I'm glad that doesn't transfer to humans. Hole in the head disease. Mm. Okay. What a way to go. Oh, yeah. It says the infection um, is a bacterium of ESC. I have no idea what that means. It's strictly a pathogen of fish. So you don't have to worry about it. Well, that's just dandy and comforting to know it just stays in fish, right? But what if you eat a fish that's got this hole in the head disease? Speaking of hole in the head, by the way, I got an Amazon package today. I ordered rags, okay? Yeah, rags. 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 Just shop rags. Yeah. And they were packed with a ton of bubble wrap. (laughs) (laughs) So they wouldn't get damaged. Oh, Oh, how nice. That's a whole new kind of dumb, right? Yeah. That's a zombie. That's that's what I would call a zombie packer, order packer. They're not thinking. (laughs) They got a hole in the head? It's a (laughs) hole in the head, yeah disease um <clears throat> and then we're gonna go from zombie fish to zombie trees so apparently that was also in the news this week zombie trees big warning about it big government warning do you know what a zombie tree would be no it's where it's dead in the inside but very much alive on the outside so it appears to be a completely normal tree until it comes crashing down on you or on your family or your kids. Uh, so apparently okay. people are being killed by zombie trees. By zombie trees. In fact, your sister, Alyssa, ended up with, you know, the spiral breaks in her wrist and really bad injuries that took her a long time to get over when she pointed up at a zombie tree and said, I gotta get this tree trimmed one of these days. And literally at that exact moment, the tree Thank came you. down the entire tree. They look completely wow. healthy. That was a zombie tree. What happens is um, fungus gets inside of it. And apparently there's some kind of new fungus that's eating them out. And they're, so they look great. The leaves are all doing good. Trunk looks normal. But the whole inside's being eaten out. So they're zombie trees. Wow. Okay? That's horrible. So they're, they're saying <clears throat> if you want to stay safe, you need to get your trees inspected once a year by an arborist. Just what everybody has a budget for. Oh, hon, got to hire the arborist. Can you imagine what that would cost? To get all your trees inspected. It's a lot of Halloween candy. But I do recommend it. I mean, you know, yeah. because it happened to our family, actually. So, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, she could have easily been killed by that tree. Yeah. But would have just fallen another foot, you know, a different direction. It would have been over. Yeah, so um, that's what a zombie tree is. Yep, that's it. Oh, Death Valley has sprung to life for the first time in a long time. Do you have photo two? I want to throw that up. It's really pretty. Although they were talking about all the flowers that were blooming in Death Valley. They didn't show any, so I don't have any of that, but that's what it looks like doesn't happen often it says death valley gleams with water wildflowers and color right now any comment there mr alex it's uh it's tough what's tough <laughs> <laughs> what's tough you know just everything you didn't even hear what i said <laughs> did you you weren't even listening oh my god you were reading comments or some damn thing. <laughs> Hello, a co-host. <laughs> Don't even listen to me. Just shuts me out. Just like you know, you know, you block your parents out. That's that's exactly yeah. what happened right yeah. there. So what? Yeah. Anyhow, Death Valley is supposed to be beautiful. It is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Anyhow, apparently they had two months of. It um, says two months after a storm that dropped a year's rainfall. In a single day, this is what caused it. Jeez. Jeez, what? It's a ton of rainfall. Oh God, yes. All right. <laughs> let's let's do it. Let's do just a, a few trivia questions. Then let's go to Doug's clips and then let's bring on David.
boy wasn't that fancy. Oh, yeah. That kind of got me off guard there. So you've heard how dogs sweat, right? How do you, how do how do dogs sweat, Alex? How do their glands? Their glands. What what glands are these? Just glands. Just they're sweat. Their sweat glands. Oh, their sweat glands. Where are those sweat glands located? Um, you know, in their in their pits. <laughs> their pits. <laughs> Their leg pits. No. A lot of people, I always heard they sweat through their tongue, you know, they're panting. Yeah. Remember? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But apparently they sweat through their paws is the only place they can sweat, which is a total BS. I don't write this crap, right? Yeah. I don't believe it. Because you ever smelled a stinky, sweaty dog? Never. They sweat everywhere. Everybody in chat, don't you agree? Dogs sweat everywhere. You know, when they're hot, yeah. they stink just like people, only worse. Okay, huh, all right. Um, now I can do these the easy way, which is, does an octopus have one heart or more? More. How many? Uh, twelve. Alex has twelve hearts. Three. Three. Yeah. You've never you've never gotten a trivia question right yet, have you? I mean, I'm, I don't know. I feel like I'm batting a thousand here. <laughs> you are a perfect, perfect record. So ants can hold up a lot of weight, right? Everybody kind of knows that. Yeah. But how much? How many times their own body weight can they hold up? Ants can an ant hold up its body weight eight hundred times. Five thousand times their own oh. body weight. So one ant is capable of lifting. 5,000 ants. And I think that's BS too. Why am I doing trivia? I don't even believe. <laughs> I don't know because I'm skeptical. I can't picture one ant holding 5,000 ants up. Right. They claim they claim they can. Seems They'd be like you. Just picture that. They'd be like you holding the whole town of the whole town you live in up. Every man, woman, and child. Just lift How them do they, up. Yeah, where do they get this number? I don't know. I guess they glued 5,000 ants together. <laughs> uh, so are bats blind? Yes. No, they're not. Bats can see. They just use ultrasound to help direct them. Oh, really? Apparently I did, they, can I, see they can actually Just see. fine. Yeah, exactly. Oh, so it's a bonus trait. So dinosaurs... Are the biggest animals to ever, li ever live and roam the earth? Yes. False. Blue, Blue whales. <laughs> Blue whales are bigger. Blue whales are bigger? Yep. Well, that's disappointing. Yep. So how, how long can a Galapagos tortoise go without water or food? 12 months. 12 months. You cheated. No, I don't. I'm not going to get them all wrong. Come on. <laughs> you got it right. That's exactly that. They go without food or water. Oh. They also sleep a lot, 16 hours a day. So if you have a tortoise as a pet, ain't doing much. It's the kind of pet I'm going to get. Yeah. Tortoise. So um, pigs roll in the mud. Why? Why do pigs roll in the mud, Mr. Alex? Because they're dirty. That's why they roll in the mud because they're pre dirty. <laughs> they're already dirty, so then they roll in the mud. Does that clean them? What, what does it do? Yeah, it cleans them. <laughs> Are you sticking to that story? Uh, it sounds like I can't. <laughs> you, you know, it's okay. They, they, they roll in the mud because they don't have any sweat glands. Oh, which I don't believe either. It just can't be true. So they don't have any. Yeah, oh, don't have many. Oh, there are many. See, also, I don't have good eyes. I'm like a bat. Yeah, but they still work. They have some. They just don't have many. So they that's why I up. roll around in the dirt. They like to. They like to do that to just keep cool. Yeah. So, how long does it take a sloth to digest some food? Seventy-two hours. Seventy-two hours, which is how many days? Do we have to divide that by 24? Let's just say three days. 
three days. It's not bad. They take two weeks. Oh, man. I'm going to get one of those, uh, grab one of my squeeze horns. Bicycle horn. Mm. (laughs) Do that when you get an answer wrong. So they have this, like, the slowest digestion of any animal. Not only is the sloth slow, they also digest their food. Mm. There you go. You lose a trivia. (laughs) Uh, how did our how did our audience do? Oh, they the got it. Question. They got them all. Yeah, in fact, I should yeah, just wait for them to right. feed me Every... the answer. Yeah, look at John. Yeah, Hilton said pigs don't seat. I know he meant sweat, but he wrote seat because mm. he was trying to get yeah, it. Trying to write it really quick. Yeah, that's what happens when you try yeah. to type too quick. Man, See? we got a smart audience here. Yep. All right. Smarter than smarter than a yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, so let's go to take that quick break, do some clips, and then bring David on. All right. <laughs> Hangar One Publishing. Books that explore the unknown. Uh, uh, They're after my story. Legends leap off the pages of our books. You think you're the only one? They're under my heels, too. From UFOs to cryptids, Bigfoot and beyond. Who's behind all this? Hangar One Publishing, where every legend is revealed. It's in the one publishing. They're unraveling all of our mysteries. Dive in. Real videos, sights, and sounds with our immersive book technology. I guess their secrets are out now. But in the best possible way. From Bigfoot tracks to galactic trails, we cover it all. We should get out of here before it's too late. You're right. Let's grab. Escaping reality. Dive into ours. Hangar One Publishing, revealing the universe's best kept secrets, one book at a time. Hello once again to everybody out there in Untold Radio Land. This is Brendan Brown, host of the fastest 30 minutes in the cryptid world, This Week in Bigfoot. The news show that scours the internet and the Bigfoot community each and every week to bring you people, places, and stories making headlines around the Bigfoot world. Here's what we got coming up on this week's show. It's UFO reporting time as Arrow releases its first detailed sighting report, leading us further down the We Are Not Alone rabbit hole. Then we head down under as Mike Lucci takes a look at the pig slaughter and strange footprints found in Australia. Snowwalker Prime's at it with another brand new Two Minutes With, You Know You Love Him, and the Bigfoot Rundown returns with more content and an exclusive Legend Meet Science 2 update. These stories and a whole lot more on the next This Week in Bigfoot this Sunday night at 6.15 p.m. Eastern, only on CARC Universal. You better be there. Hey, Untold Radio Network fans. Want exclusive perks and to support our channel? Introducing our YouTube membership program with three amazing levels. Get loyalty badges that level up to different cryptids the longer you're a supporter. How cool is that? You'll also get access to custom Bigfoot emojis and priority in chat. Upgrade to Backstage Pass for exclusive wallpapers, photos, status updates, discounted books, and merchandise. Go all in with the producer level for everything mentioned plus member shoutouts. Ready for an enhanced experience? Join now, pick your membership level, and let's make this journey even more exciting together. Hey. Hey, 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 hey. Okay. Clip one. The sound is totally good. This clip, don't play it yet, is totally nuts. How do how would you know, Alex, if you have a squirrel living in your house? 
I don't like to get in vents and roof vents and, you know, oven vents and fireplaces. How would you know if you had a squirrel living in your house? I, because you'd uh, see evidence. You'd see evidence. (laughs) You wouldn't, you wouldn't hear them. (laughs) <laughs> you can probably hear them, yeah, in the wall. Right, go ahead and play the clip. This is how you know you have a squirrel living in your house. I think we've got squirrels. <laughs> is that is that nuts? Oh, I don't see anything yet. Acorn City. That's how you know you got squirrels living in your house. Oh Thanks. my gosh! All right, enough of that. Clip two, sound is good. You ever heard of the Phantoms, Alex? Oh. So apparently there's a military group called the Phantoms, and that's what this clip is about. I don't know if it's BS. Probably is. You know how that goes, but maybe it's not. Go ahead and play it. Phantoms, the Paranormal Hunting Anomaly Neutralization Team of Military Specialists, a unit of only Tier 1 soldiers, a highly secretive military special operations team, remarkable operators from all over the world come together under one name as one collective with only one objective, to slay the things most of society believes doesn't exist, and that's how they would prefer it. In the year 2016, deep within a national park not far from a Navajo reservation, a series of unsettling events had gripped the area. Hikers had mysteriously vanished, and chilling reports emerged of vehicles being pursued, sometimes forced off the road, by enigmatic entities. These incidents had troubled the community for years, confounding local law enforcement, who initially dismissed any connections among the cases. However, as the mounting evidence became impossible to ignore, the state asked for federal help, and after nothing but dead ends, the feds themselves weren't making progress. That's when the Phantoms got involved unknowingly amongst anyone on the state and federal level. The Phantoms were briefed on the string of disappearances and unsettling reports, but their mission was clear. They weren't here to search what for survival. What do you survivors. think, Alex? Real? Their objective was Pick. to neutralize any non-human entities responsible for these disturbances. We basically reports. had those ranger the guys on them. Known in Navajo, Navajo the Navajo Rangers. Yeah, the Navajo which Rangers. Which translates to, with it, they weren't it runs on all fours. Legend all right, had that's it enough. That these being... I mean, we get the idea. I don't want to waste too much time, but we get the idea. So it's something to check into, investigate, right? Yeah. Is this the first you heard of them? Yeah. Yeah, it's good to know that we've got military going after the Mothman. So this is really cool. So this child is a very young man. He makes these really cool dual-purpose shadow boxes, right? Mm-hmm. He uses just hot glue, doesn't really care what they look like. He cares what the shadow oh, looks oh. like. Yeah. But what's really cool is he, each one has a dual scene. But watch what happens at the end. Go ahead. Oh, cool. Some of these are really cool. Wow. Now we we figured this out. It's pretty crazy. He just makes them with hot glue and cardboard. Tears it by hand, doesn't cut it. Tears it. Man. So it's like basketball players, right? Yeah. Fish, and then suddenly it's that. All right, we get the idea. It's cool. It's something you can Alex. do if you have nothing to do tonight. <laughs> After the show, get a cardboard box, a light, and some hot glue. Start trying to make your... Your your loved one, your your significant other in a shadow. You should do that, Alex, with Ilse tonight. You should try to. Yeah, I I don't know how with cardboard that would turn and out. She'd never talk to you again. <laughs> I, can, I can only imagine. Okay, um, clip four. The sound is fine, but what do you do when you wake up and you have a ton of twelve hundred pound animals on your suburban lawn? And there's part A to this and part B. Go ahead and play it. Sounds fine. This one's kind of slow, but just picture this. These are not small. I mean, these are 1,200-pound animals or more. Oh, my gosh. Could you imagine? It's like going to get to your car. It's parked in the driveway. (laughs) All right. Enough of that. To play part B. Yeah. 
This will give you a better idea of how many. And this is in um, Estes Park, Colorado. Don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right. They have a lot of elk there. Go ahead and play it. Look at this. So it's not one neighbor, it's all of them. Unbelievable. So what would you do? Would you ask them to leave? Would you <laughs> get your Nerf squirt gun out and start squirting them? What would you do? All right, clip know. five. Um, yeah. Sound is good. Now, this is interesting. Once again, I have not vetted this. I have studied quantum physics. But this is where they're going to talk about how basically – Subatomic particles below quarks don't exist, which means if subatomic particles below quarks aren't don't exist, but they make quarks, are you following? That means that we don't exist. So go ahead and play. It's interesting. So crazy to me. There's actually scientific proof that humans are not physical beings and that, in fact, nothing in our universe is physical or solid. This is a picture of a quark. So quantum physics tells us that everything is fundamentally made up of atoms. Everything in our universe is made up of atoms that are made up of electrons, neutrons, and protons. And protons and neutrons are made up of quarks. And electrons are made up of leptons. Think about this when you go to bed what are quarks tonight. and leptons made of? They're made of nothing. Quarks and leptons are just pure energy. Quarks and leptons are fast moving points of pure energy. They're made up of literally nothing. They are nothing. So that means that at the fundamental core of the atom and therefore at the fundamental core of everything in our universe, there is no material there. It's just pure energy. It's energy vortices. You are just energy vortices. Energy is only transformed. It's neither created nor destroyed. So this energy that is you and that is everything persists forever. It is immortal. So this means that you're not just a temporary flesh sack that lives for 80 years, then dies forever. You are the same energy as everything in our universe. All right, so this means enough. that explains everything, right? Yeah. I'm, I've been enlightened. Yeah. How come when I try to walk through a door, I smack my head? Yeah. Let's see her explain that. But, you know, if you think about it, yeah, there's truth in what she says. Yeah. All right, so where are we at here? Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. Clip six, the sound is good. What, do you, what sound do you think lobsters make? Nasty one. Listen. Go ahead and play that again. That's, like, that's it. Isn't that interesting? That's all their hinges, their rusty hinges, mm. their tail. It's interesting. I'd never heard that sound. Oh, no. no, me either. Now you can think about that when you're eating your lobster, <laughs> which they claim are just bugs. You know, we're eating all these yeah. shrimp and lobsters. All these are just insects of the ocean. Well, Related to the spider. So we're eating spider meat. Mm, everyone loves spiders. Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, speaking of um, things that live in the water, clip eight sound is good. You know, Asian carp are really hard to control. No, this is not. What, what the heck? Oh, oh, no, no, no. That's right. This is clip seven. Ah, I skipped that. Go ahead. Put up clip seven. Sound is great. So this is really interesting. Don't Don't play it yet. So this is just, this is a sound that light makes impacting a surface, obviously very strong light with a lot of power behind it. But this sound is actually quite pleasing and very satisfying for, I find it that way. And there's a lot of new machines you can buy that will clean rust, for instance, mm. evaporate rust with lasers. Go ahead and play it. There's this old rusty knife. And just using light is going to turn this thing into a really cool thing. Listen to this sound. Right out of Star Wars, baby.
And that is the real sound. I actually looked into buying one of these. So wait, the sound don't put your hand in front of it. No. But the people are using cool. these to clean driveways, roadways, yeah. graffiti off buildings. Quite handy and quite it's quick. Oh, so clean. Yeah, and this is how they remove like tattoos out of your skin. Yeah, obviously not this powerful. But listen to this sound. No, believe it or not, it wasn't over. This way it gets it gets better. Anybody like that sound? I do. Alex? Here we go. You like that sound, Alex? Earth to Alex. It wasn't over. I can't sorry, you keep talking, I can't hear you. I keep talking, you can't hear me. Yeah. Anyhow, put it back. It wasn't done. The sound is cool. What do you think of the sound? Okay, and now it's a note. It almost sounds like voices, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's got a really weird sound to it. Yeah, it's weird. I love it. I actually like it. I find it hypnotizing. Soothing. Okay, and now we are going to clip eight. Asian carp are hard to control. This shows the battle that they're waging in all of our rivers, you know, south of, I guess they've come pretty far north. I mean, they're right at the, great, the gate of the Great Lakes now. But go ahead and play this clip. They're using electro fishing, I believe, and then scooping them into a little tiny compartment. I mean, they're not going to put a dent in this, doing it this way. They need a bigger <laughs> boat, if you know what I yeah, mean. Yeah, I'd say. They have like a four by four net that they're, you know, scooping them into this little hole in the boat, and that's not going to do much. Isn't that crazy, though? It's incredible. Clip nine will surprise people. Okay. Uh, don't don't play it yet. Do you leave it there? Sound is good. It's very important, actually, the sound. Um, hydrogen, this is a tanker carrying hydrogen. And and the they have to have a valve called a TPRD valve, which releases when you transport hydrogen, you may be going through on a hot sunny day. Pressure might get too hot, and they have to release it. Now, either I've, I've, I've tried to investigate it, and I've heard they have a PZO ignition system, so when it lets the hydrogen go, it ignites it. And I've also heard it just ignites on its own when it's being released. And there's a study, and I did read, this, read a scientific study last night that said they are battling problems with hydrogen, you know, catching fire, like you're about to see, when... Um, uh, pressure is released quickly. Go ahead and play it. So if you rolled into a gas station and saw this, you'd be freaked out. Oh, yeah. Not good. Is that is that what happens to you after Taco Bell? <laughs> I won't tell you about what I ate last night. <laughs> yeah. I had Taco Bell last night. Yeah. Did you? It's good going down. I don't know about coming out. Did you have Taco Bell too? Yeah, I did. You really did. Yeah, I did. God, I swear to God you were my son. <laughs> it's all weird. Right. Isn't that cool though? Yeah. All right. Clip 10. We've all heard of geckos. This is actually a gecko. And this gecko is called the Goo slinging gecko i've never heard of a goose slinging gecko it's just it's insane when they feel like uh they're about to get eaten this is what they do go ahead okay. 
There you go. Legless lizard. That's that's all you need to see. Praise exclusively. That's a predator. Oh, legless yes. salamander or lizard that was coming to get the gecko in. His defense is to spray all that stuff out of his tail. Clip 11, a bonus. All right. And then really quick. On. Super Let's quick. Do it. But this is scary, man. This guy was, you know, these guys are dirt bike riding through the woods. And this happens. And the guy had enough sense to rev the engine to scare it away. I think that's a grizzly bear. But I can't tell you. Can't see the hump. Scary, huh? Yeah. Crap can yeah, happen to anybody at any moment. <clears throat> so you ready to get David on? He's in the back room. I am ready. Now, David is a lifelong, this is important, lifelong resident of Oklahoma, south, east Oklahoma. East. Not northeast, not northwest, southeast Oklahoma. He has an interest in the Bigfoot mystery since he was a young child. we got to find out why. His parents probably tried to scare the crap out of him like I tried to do you when you were young. <laughs> yeah, well, it worked. Okay, it says <laughs> in the mid-1990s, he began documenting and investigating sighting reports of this el elusive cryptid. In the late 1990s and into the mid-2000s, he had a website called southernbigfoot.com, which he collected Bigfoot sightings from Oklahoma, surrounding states in 2001. He was... Featured on the Travel Channel's documentary, Bigfootville. See? Told you. See? Yeah. You need to yeah. watch that, Bigfootville. I do. I do need to. It's actually, it's a, it's a decent, it's a fun doc. It really is. They just, it's fun. Um, uh, and that's, in Bigfootville, they, they delved into a rash of Bigfoot sightings in Oklahoma. And Oklahoma is a hot spot. So let's welcome David Wilbanks. Hey, David. Hello. Hey. Now, I know you're not really in the woods, but it sure the hell looks like you are. <laughs> I am. I'm actually in the back of my business. I own a music store in downtown Ada, Oklahoma, and I'm in the back of it. Ah. In my defense, I did take the picture of the woods at a campsite down there. Oh, there you go. Okay. The there you go. <laughs> let's it's that real qualifies you. Yeah. That qualifies you. So what do, what kind of music store do you have? Just do you sell everything? Uh combo. I sell guitars, amplifiers, oh, cool. uh, other stringed instruments, do repairs, guitar lessons. Matter of fact, we just finished the last guitar lesson of the day uh, just a few minutes ago. Well, I'll be okay. dinged. You never know what somebody does for a living. And I've had this shop since nineteen ninety two. So Did you know there's a lot of musicians that are into Bigfoot? I have found that out. It's yeah. weird. Why? What do you think? That's a good question. I don't know if that's just coincidence or or what. I've never really never really thought of that. Well, no. Everybody, everybody has to think about that going forward. But yeah. I meet so many people. <laughs> they're into Bigfoot, and they're really good musicians, too. They're not just like somebody just starting out. I mean, I meet... I probably meet one Bigfoot researcher per week that's a good musician. Oh. So it's, you know, it's, well, that it's, is a, it's a thing. It's definitely We're in good a thing. company. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't, I can't play anything. But have you ever met a Bigfoot that's a good musician? I actually, you know what? I just listened to some tapes today <laughs> that Christopher Noel sent, who of a lady who recorded the most crazy drumming. That I've ever heard. So, yes. So, Bigfoot is a percussionist. Yes, they are. Yeah. I mean, I, it's just nuts. It's in my message. I should send it to Alex. It's nuts. Oh, oh I shouldn't play it. We got to get her permission. But I am. we are planning on taking some of her recordings and getting them analyzed okay. and doing something with them for our Ledge of Meat Science, too. Because this is kind of a common thing where they actually they do percussive things but we don't know if they do it with their body their mouth 
their throat or are they really beating sticks? What do you think? Um, maybe all of the above. I have personally heard um, what I'm very positive is, is a wood knock. Just the, the sound is of wood striking wood. But yeah. I've also heard a, a rock clacking. On, on some of these and you've actually got some people in the uh, chat over there that was with me on one of those occasions the thing is we don't really even rock lacking could be them cracking their knuckles or it could be you know we just don't know well the, the reason i'm saying that is that where we were at at this location and um there was a creek below us with a lot of rocks in the creek and then woods above us i was on the edge of this ridge uh, camping there, and there were wood knocks uh, coming from above, and then they were answered down in the creek, which was full of rocks below us by the sound of rocks clacking together. So that's that's why I put that together like that. Yeah, no, it does. It does. It sounds exactly like rocks clacking. You know, I've heard it. I've heard it personally, and I've heard you know very my, very many hundreds of recordings. It's very consistent. I just. I don't know what it is. You just can't can't picture them banging rocks together. Well, I mean, yeah, but <laughs> who knows why they do what they do? You know, I know. But it could be I, a combination of all of the above. You know. So David Ellis said, "I just I said he recorded a really neat drumming riff in the woods. It was so complicated. I call the clip John Bonham reprise." I don't even know what John Bonham John is. John Bonham, drummer for Led Zeppelin. Bonham? Oh, is that Led Zeppelin drummer? Okay, yeah. there you go. Yeah. Shows what I know. I'll have to know those things. I'm a music story. You know? <laughs> yeah. So how did you get interested in um, Bigfoot? Oh, well, there you are. I didn't see either of you guys for a second. Oh, uh, here. Well, it wasn't from a... Oh, and by the way, i got to set this for you guys. I was listening uh, backstage earlier. It's Kayamishi. Kayamishi, okay. Kayamishi. That actually sounds very great, very graceful. Tell if somebody's from Oklahoma or not just by listening to them pronounce that. It's Kayamishi is uh, how that's actually. Pronounced. Just be glad I didn't say Kia. Uh, there, there's actually a fellow from Texas that's been making some little Bigfoot documentaries and, and uh, self-produced movies, and he, he what does he call it? Kiyamichi or something there like you that. Go. But, but it, it is Kaimishi Big. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful Big. word. So, um, yeah, I don't know what it means, but. Uh, oh, you don't. No, the fur and here's the thing: the further southeast in Oklahoma you get, the more uh, you'll come across these creeks and areas, and they've all got these uh, like Choctaw or Chickasaw names. Mm -hmm. You'll just see, and and you get further southeast, there's a creek every hundred yards. It seems like as you're going down the highway, and there'll be like a Boktukalo or. Uh, Yana B. And, uh, and if you don't know somebody that you hear them pronounce it correctly, I wouldn't have a clue either. Yeah. But they're, they're oddly spelled words. And, and what are the natives that, that occupied Southeast or do right. occupy Southeast Oklahoma? Well, the far Southeast, which is McCurtain, LaFleur, Pishmaton, and, and uh, such, that is Choctaw Nation. And I'm just uh, where I'm at sitting right now, Ada, Oklahoma, is Chickasaw. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> I was raised in a little town called Calvin, and that's Creek Nation, which borders that. So Oklahoma still split into the, the different tribal nations uh, like that. Yeah. So. yeah. Have you studied some of the lore of the Native American lore of Bigfoot in uh, Oklahoma? Yeah. As a matter of fact, my first, uh, the first book I wrote was a fictional story about a, a Bigfoot type creature in, in Choctaw folklore, folklore called the Champe. And uh, my research on that, I, I have customers that are, are native speakers and, and up to the lore. And uh, one of those gentlemen, uh, Tim Harjo, was in Bigfootville with me. And sadly, he passed away uh, last year from uh, complications of uh, COVID. But, um, he uh, knew a lot of the lore and how to pronounce the names. And I, when I was writing, if I had questions on, I say, "Hey Tim, what would be a name for this? You know, say a say a Sasquatch type creature that uh, wasn't very nice." Of course, he brought up the Champe, and I said, "Well, what would you call, say, in a Choctaw, just the benevolent 
forest giant, Bigfoot. What would you call that? He said, uh, in uh, Choctaw, Hatak Chito, which hmm. just simply means big man. And in Chickasaw, it's almost the same. It's Hatak. Um, I can't. I can't remember the Chickasaw name, but it's it's the same. Hatak, the first part, uh, which means man, and mm. it's or Choctaw, and then that. So, yeah, I do. Uh, I being in this part, I do have several uh, friends and customers that do speak the you know Chickasaw or Choctaw, and I would definitely ask them you know questions uh, regarding such. Well, but apparently, um, uh, Abe and Will Starr. I'm thinking they were Googling, but um, Kaimichi means noisy bird, probably referring to the woodpeckers that occupy that area. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, Will Starr, he's a friend of mine. He is, he's pretty quick on looking stuff up like yeah, that. Yeah, he's a friend. He has actually been on a, a two day uh, expedition. Oh, in the okay. Wilderness with me. Awesome. Uh, yeah, he's a great guy. About a year ago. Yeah, Will's a good guy. Yeah, hi, Will. Hey, Will. I haven't heard from you in a while, Will. Give me a call, Will. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, well, yeah, we, we had some interesting experiences when, when Will was down. We heard the wood knocking and, oh, and okay. uh, moving around our camp, a really loud vocalization right behind us. We were no campfires because there was a burn ban when he was down, and we were out. Yeah, I remember him telling me that. And he tell you about the rock being thrown in. Yep, the yep. He told me stories. <laughs> so you're the one that you you're the one that was with him. Okay. Well, he was with me. Well, <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. Uh, he came down from uh from up up north in Ohio. You know, he's trying to get me to go up there, and I would love to. But the only phobia that I have is heights, which has kept me off of uh, airplanes. Oh. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's not that far of a drive. I think Will lives in what New York or Pennsylvania or somewhere. Uh, it's Ohio, I believe. But yeah, it's Ohio, that's, that's somewhere like, out yeah, east, yeah, right down here in southeast Oklahoma. But um, yeah, you asked how I got interested in this subject earlier. Yes, uh, it's not because my parents scared me with anything. Um, as I, I grew up in the middle of nowhere from as far back as I remember, I was traipsing around in the woods, a lot of times even by myself, and I don't have any fear of the woods. Um, but my mother worked for a veterinarian back in the in the 60s named Dr. Lewis Stiles. And he, I don't think I'm exaggerating at all. Anything you would want to know about the outdoors, nature, uh, archaeology, stuff like that, he was a scholar in all of it. And as far as the Bigfoot uh, subject, he was what I called a hopeful skeptic. He really didn't think that there was much of a chance of it, but he still collected everything to do with, with uh, Bigfoot. And he, he had bought um, Roger Patterson's book, The Abominable Snowman in America Really Exist. And he had that at his house. And every time we went down, even before I knew how to read, I knew where that book was. And I looked through the pictures and stuff on it. Um, and that, that was my interest in it. And then when I was about oh, 10 years old, he shared with me a, a newspaper report that said somebody down around Broken Bow, which is far southeast Oklahoma, about as far southeast as you can get, that somebody had been camping in a remote area uh, down there uh, closer to Idabel and uh, had an encounter with a Bigfoot. And then that was the first time I got the inkling or the heard rumor that there might be these things in Oklahoma. So I was okay. hooked for life, you know, just really interested in it. Fascinating. So have you, other than um, the time Will came down to hang out with you, do you do a lot of field work, David? Uh, quite a bit, actually. Now, in the late 90s, for a very brief period, I was actually a local uh, contact uh, for the BFRO. Mm. Uh, I wasn't a member of the BFRO. I think there's still a report or two on their database that has my name on it. But um, I did, you know, some, there was, it was really over like one summer, spring and summer. Um, and I looked into about four cases that uh, Matt sent my way on that. Uh, the most telling one of those would have been the uh, the casino footage incident. I don't know if you've heard of that. Oh yeah, I was. Um, I I tried to get 
to see it many years ago for Mysterious Encounters when I was producing that. Who was the PI that they had sent down to? That, that's Roger Roberts. Now, I was the first one on the scene. Okay. Oh. Roger and Roger had a friend of his. This other gentleman was from Smithville, and I don't, I do not remember his name. He wasn't a Bigfoot guy. Yeah. He was just a, a friend of Roger's. Uh, actually, me and Roger looked into into all of, all the cases that I mentioned. We kind of worked together on, but um, I got the email about that, and I was like, going, yeah. I, don't think I'm going to go. That's up there on the prairie. And there, why would there be a Bigfoot up there? And, and Matt was saying like, well, they say they've got it on um, video surveillance. And I said, well, I'll I'll make the trip. That's about a three hour drive from where I'm at. So I got up there in the early afternoon, looked up the uh, gentleman I was supposed to, the name was Keith um, and talked to him. He showed me, uh, had a wad of hair that supposedly had been caught on a, a boat arc thorn bush on this game trail. Well, well okay. Well, well, let me interrupt you, David, before okay. we, we'll just pick it up right there, but tell us what, what the story was, the main story of what happened. What well, did, what, what, okay. what did they describe happening? All right. So apparently there had been uh, different people been saying that they had seen this Bigfoot type creature out around this wooded area. Now, as far as the what was caught on the casino footage out behind the casino um there was a grease trap which that you know i've heard other people say it was a dumpster i heard somebody say well we saw the film they grabbed a trash bag out of the dumpster and ran off no it was not a dumpster it was a grease trap which basically looks just like a dumpster but on the middle of the top Mm -hmm. of it there's a smaller square lid about two foot yeah i always heard dumpster too Okay, that's not true. Okay, Um, they had this smaller lid, which they would unlock, raise it up, and pour their cooking grease in, shut it up. So what was happening, what was told me was they had video of this creature walking up, trying to get into this grease trap. So I got there, nosed around, of course, with with, uh, Keith, um, and about closer to dark, Roger and his friend, you know, arrived there. And they actually led us into the, I'm just calling it the security room where they had their televisions and stuff set that they could uh, see what was uh, outside. And they played, uh, it was about, you know, looking back, I think it was probably only five or six seconds, but you saw what you had this, um, like a light pole that came up over the grease trap. And I've got a picture of it. Uh, I could show you sometime. Um, but it come down over the, over this grease trap. And what, what it did is this creature walked under that light to the grease trap and leaned over like, I had heard it was really tall. The, 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 yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'll get to how we, how okay. we formed that, uh, because it's head almost, it come pretty close to where the ball, they kind of, you know, leaned over, uh, the, like the grease trap here, the light was like this. Okay. So when we watched it, this is what we saw at first. And you saw off to the, it would have been coming slightly from the north. There's a parking lot there. And you see at first just a little bit of a, a glow. And, and keep in mind, you've seen surveillance video. They're not the clearest thing in the world, right? But you see kind of a little glow. Now, Roger, he thought it was eye shine. I my perception was it was like the street lamp reflecting off the top of its head, which that's neither here nor there. But that's what you saw at first. And then it got closer into the light. You seen the whole form of it kind of, I use the term materialize, not as a supernatural effect, but just coming into view under the light. And it was very tall, kind of lanky and uh, covered in dark hair. You know, you can't really make out the, the actual color, whether it was, brown, black, or reddish, but it was a darker color. And it took a couple of steps and leaned over like toward the, uh, towards the top of that. And um, we had them play that back to us several times. And I, I still remember, and, and people over there in chat that have been on my show, so I've heard this a thousand times from me, but uh, I remember looking over at Roger and just saying, I'll be darned, they are real. And up, you know, up to that, um, up to that point, 
this was just a fun subject I was interested in. I thought it was probably a pretty good chance they're real. But when I saw that, especially when we went out and measured up the side of that pole, how tall this thing was, that's like these things. Wow. So we went outside to this and uh, me and Roger and his friend and measured up that pole. And we were able to ascertain that this thing was over nine feet tall. And I, I still remember telling Roger, I said, I think that kind of rules out a guy in a monkey suit. Yeah. If, so, yeah. If, if you guys really came to that conclusion. And, and it was very easy to do. Um, like I, I said, I've got a picture of the, of the grease trap with a, a gentleman standing under it. I actually used that picture in my presentation at the Honubby Bigfoot conference a couple of weeks ago. Um, when I, when I talked down there, but uh, yeah, it, you know, and I've seen re recreations of it on TV and it always, you know, recreation shows this kind of big blocky lumbering. This thing was not like that. It was fluid. I mean, it moved like almost liquid, just very fluid in its movement, just very natural and um, smooth, not like lumbering or nothing. I mean, Whoa. just smooth. It just smoothly like drifted into the, into the frame there. And if there's more, of that video or if there's if it's longer or whatever or there's others i don't know that's what they allowed us to see and i want to say the the only person i know of and i've heard i've talked to other people that say they've seen it some of them describe what i saw but then others describe something you know totally different and all and all i say to that was if there is a video of a Bigfoot getting trash out of a dumpster behind, behind that casino, that means there's another one because that's not the one that we were shot. <clears throat> Do you think this footage still exists? It's hard to say. I know, that, I know that they shut down. Now, I, I, there's a gentleman named Alton Higgins who's a wildlife biologist. I know Alton. Yep. Oklahoma, that, uh, I, I knew him back then for a, for about a time as well, and I think he saw it at a later date. Mm. But uh, I know that not very long after we saw that, word had gotten out about it, and um, people started just basically trespassing on tribal property and just kind of making a nuisance of themselves. And from what I understand, they just said, oh, no more, you know. So, which is, you know, really a shame, I think. Um, yeah, I would love to see it again because that was over, that was over 20 years ago. You know, if I well, remember, have you made an effort to try to, you know, to, to contact anybody that may have the footage in their possession? I have, I spoke to a lady at the Honubi conference that was in the audience that when I asked if anybody's seen it, she said she had. Wow. And she said what she saw was, and she was a native woman, so she might have had access to it. Um, one would, of the, would, would you be willing to, like, sign an affidavit that that thing was nine feet tall? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, why not? <laughs> I mean, I'm just curious. It's, uh, I mean, yeah, Roger Roberts, he, he'll tell you the same thing. I mean, it's, is, is he still around? I, you know, I haven't spoke to Roger in in a long time. So I, rem I, I remember talking to him. Alton is. I know Alton is. Yeah, Alton's it. around. But I remember talking to the PI on the phone because um, we were working on a TV show and okay. we were trying to get it on Mysterious Encounters because I was doing a show on Oklahoma. Um, and we didn't have any luck, which was, you know, heartbreaking. Didn't have any luck. Yeah, you know, seeing the footage and getting the rights to yeah, it. Yeah, I don't, I, I would, I, it would be hard for me to imagine that they would have destroyed something like that, but I would, you know, yeah. it's not something that apparently they wanted the publicity from and they kind of shut it down. You wouldn't I, think though, you know, you would have thought that that would have been amazing publicity for their casino. Well, and, and the thing is where that, okay, the last time I was at that casino was about, 10 years ago yeah it was to go see white snake in concert mm. and if i'm exactly correct i think where the stage is inside that room is about where that grease trap set back then so that casino is a lot bigger now because oh, yeah. 
and stuff there. That's crazy. So, uh, but yeah, and the gentleman uh, named Keith, I'm not going to say his last name uh, live, just out of respect for the family, but he, uh, a friend of mine said he passed away not too long ago. Mm -hmm. So as far as the people that were there, he's really the only one that I knew. What, what do you think about that, Alex? I mean, you're probably hearing this for the first time, this story. I don't know. I just, um, it's hard to, you know, feel one way or another about it. I mean, I don't know. The, I guess what I'm getting at is the fact they wouldn't release it kind of adds to the credibility of it. Yeah. Yeah. That they have something to, to yeah. hide actually. And really? I mean, if I had not been there and like I say, you, let, you talk to Roger He's going to tell you the exact same thing I did. Yeah. And I've, I've heard, I heard a radio interview uh, on, on some Bigfoot website where he's recounting it. And the only difference in what he recalls in me is what we both interpreted that glow that you first see. He thought it was, he perceived it as I shine. My thought was just like, you know, reflection off the top of his head or something. But still seeing the same thing whether well you had mentioned you you have a still photo of something what's this I, ha I have a still photo of um the uh actual grease trap oh with, i with see the okay that met us there standing under it with lifting his hand up toward the toward the rod itself you see i might have it on see the story i remember is that it ducked under a street light well it didn't really have to duck um but its head came almost to the top of it. Let me see if I got that wow. picture on my phone. If I do, I'll hold it up to the camera. Interesting. Uh, yeah, we're, we definitely got to get to the siege of everybody know, doesn't know how to pronounce that. Hanobia. Hanobi. Honubi. Say that again, David. Honubi. Honubi. Ho okay. Yeah, doesn't sound right. It's, it's one of those Oklahoma words. It's not um, not pronounced anything like the way it's spelled. I've heard it pronounced wrong for so many years that your your correct pronunciation sounds incorrect to me. Yeah, ah, here we go. I don't know if you'll be able to see this up to the camera. Uh, uh, yeah, well, defeated by the green screen. You're, you're defeated by the green screen. Here, let me uh, zoom in on you. There you go. Oh, there it is. I see it now. Yeah. Okay, it does it. look like a dumpster. Well, it looks like a dumpster, but it's really not. Yeah. It's It's got the smaller, <laughs> defeated by the green screen. But yeah. anyway, um, it's, I guess with practicality, it, it is a dumpster, but the lid on it is different. Okay, the lid, you have a smaller square in the middle of the top of it that you lift up to put the grease in. But it did, there's, it wasn't something that had trash bags in it. Well, Kevin says, send it to Alex, your picture, through Messenger if you can. He'll throw it up. Yeah, if you want to do that, David, I'll pop it in. I've the... never seen this, so it's really interesting to me because this brings me back like 20 years ago, 23 years ago. Oh wait, wait, wait! Uh, I need to. I need to send you the one with the gentleman's face blurred out. Yes. I don't want to. I don't want to send somebody's likeness. No. Out gotcha. Uh, can I send you? Can I send you that from one of my files later? Well, yeah, yeah. but we wanted to see it on the show. Oh. We want to see it. We want to see it now, David. We're impatient. Yeah. Well, We're like little little children here. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me see if I can, uh, let's see. Is it, is it on your computer? Yeah, that's what I'm I mean. Doing. This, the story is so legendary. I mean, it's well, and you know, the thing about that story, if I had not actually been there and saw it, yeah, myself, that's, I would just, um, I mean, this is kind I of important. Write, I would write it off as just another silly story but it's and you're sure there was no way a guy could have been in a suit no unless he was one incredibly tall individual yeah like yeah uh, that's that's the good that's kind of the deal but what did the um and the body 
did it look muscular and thin or just it was thin? lanky and, and from my recollection it was it the description that I've consistently used over the years would be like take a a pro basketball player and cover him in hair. Okay. Uh, I'm looking for that picture with the face blurred out on it. I may not have much luck here. No, it's fine. We're, we're trying. Let's see. We're trying. Yeah, I didn't even think about that before. I'm, I'm being greedy. I actually just, I want to see it. Only because... Um, you know, this is just one of those things that was so close into my hand to put this on right. TV into a national audience. And then, boom, it, you know, got pulled out. The rug got pulled out from under me. Well, no, I can't, I can't find that. So, one. Well, that so okay, well, that's fine. So let's just get, let's get back to it. Okay. What did, um, what was the reaction of the natives that you talked to? Or the casino workers, um, were they, you know, excited about it? Were they put off by it? Not I mean, really. Do they just no, believe it? it? Nobody seemed to be that overly excited about it. Huh. You know, I, not not anything like like I was. <laughs> you know, I was pretty blown away. Um, but no, they were seemed to be pretty kind of matter of fact about it. You know. Um, uh, the casino people that we talked to were like all, um, um, my recollection anyway, were like security folks, you know, because that's who had to show us into the room. But um, yeah, I don't remember anybody just being blown away about like, oh, you're not going to believe this. I mean, they just seemed kind of matter of fact about it. Which would lead me to believe that it is, you know, there's something there. Well, I think that, you know what I think, a reward should be offered for the footage. Um, to be yeah. able to, I mean, you know, I, we need I, to. It would be hard for me to believe that it did not still exist somewhere. You would think somebody's got it, but the, you'd hate to have that person die and <laughs> nobody know about it. And that hard drive end up in a garbage dump, you know. Yeah, of course. You know, here's the. The heck of it is back then when it did when that was uh, taken. If only at that time we'd have had cell phones that had the type of cameras on them that we did. Yeah. You know, I would have snapped a picture of that thing. But they were. I mean, yeah. we had to sign. I can't remember what we signed, but we, me and Roger and and his friend, we all had to sign some kind of release. No oh, okay. things to get in. So you it. signed an NDA, um, non-disclosure agreement. No, well, not a non-disclosure. It was oh. just it was just something showing that they had let us into that room, that security room. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, no, there was never any Yeah, there there those security rooms are hard to get into at a casino. But yeah, they I mean they invited us in to show it. I mean yeah, somebody I there had contacted obviously contacted the BFRO for them to you know, send us out there. Yeah, because I was working with Matt, see, at the time. And Matt was in the show, and Matt was the one that suggested, you know, or got the call and then immediately told me about it. And, mm -hmm. and I was really excited, especially when I talked to the PI. And he was saying, no, oh, man, that's, that's the real deal, man. Yeah, yeah, I, I just... I try not to underestimate people's ability to hoax, but that yeah. would have been a tough one. Uh, now, mm -hmm. nowadays, maybe not so much, but back then, now, if somebody had showed me supposed security footage after the fact on a different device, different, but when I'm, we're allowed to be in the casino to see it raw. Well, I'm 100% I'm, I'm sure that I could have come to a 100% conclusion and whether it was real or hoaxed by the footage. I, so. I don't believe it was hoaxed. I, I just okay. don't see that it... Well, let's keep that on the back burner. And yeah. um, if you, David, or somebody who hears this, um, I think we could raise a little money to give to whoever's got the footage to not see it, but to, to air it to the public, mm. to get it out in the public domain. I mean, they can still own the rights to it, but it needs to go into a show. 
People need to see it. Yeah, it needs to go into like legend meets science or something. Yeah. If, if you can pull that off, you're a lot better than anybody that's come before you. <laughs> well, I've pulled I've pulled off some newsies. Let me tell yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, I know. You've been around a while. In this. Um interesting. Okay, let's let's switch yeah, gears. See if you do, man. <laughs> let's let's talk about the siege of um Hanobi. Honubi. Honubi. Sorry. Yeah. Now, it's that not, it's not did happening. Not, I did not investigate that one. But let's uh, let's hear the story. Um, and if you've heard any details that nobody's heard, that would be nice to throw something in. And your personal thoughts as you're telling the story. Well, the personal thoughts, I think something really did happen there. Okay. Okay. And the people that had that house, they don't they don't live there now. Somebody else does. Um but, but what what was the siege? Apparently, well, apparently there was a Sasquatch or Sasquatches, more than one, coming up taking uh, deer meat out of an outdoor freezer. Correct. And there were some shots fired at it, supposedly shooting one of them. And uh, then there was a bunch of racket in the woods and things like that that went on for a while. Now, I know now Roger... Roberts. Now he he was one of the investigators on that, but that was before uh, I met Roger. The only the um, thing that Roger and I had investigated in that area was about probably fifteen miles east of there, uh, on what a deal called Eagle Creek, and we had investigated a sighting by a fisherman that was fishing along that creek, and he saw one of these things step out of the water and I, I camped there a few nights and actually found some interesting footprints and stuff but um but now the siege of home i think something really did happen there okay so, but, but what what is the siege though i mean it was uh, more than just deer meat being taken out of the freezer really well wasn't wasn't there even um uh it was two was it two brothers that lived there well one brother lived there Okay, uh, but no. But I'd even heard that like this thing came into their garage. Um, no, 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 you haven't uh, heard that. About all I know about it is. So it was just deer meat, and one of them got shot, and did it leave a blood trail? Was there an injury that they thought they would hit it? Well, how did? Well, I guess what I'm getting at is why is it so legendary? I, I don't I mean, know. There's been old books written about it. But it, I think they, uh, I think the Tulsa paper ran a story on it. That's that's probably a lot of it. Um, but no, I mean, from what I know about it is something was taking meat out of the outdoor freezer and they saw a Sasquatch doing it from what I understand. Um, and they, one of them shot at it. One of the brothers did or shot it. Now, later stories that I heard later was somebody uh, driving a truck, nearly hit one on the road. And later on, I heard the story like, well, he almost hit one and it was carrying a dead one. And wow. as time goes by, these stories tend to grow. Now, the original mm -hmm. story that that all that I know is that supposedly the Sasquatch was taking meat out of the freezer outside and and one of them got shot the big okay. foot. yeah were there any repercussions like rocks thrown at the home or i don't know don't know okay no, I don't know. all right well let's um let's let's keep switch gears into your book what is obviously you've got a collection of stories in your book david which one do you want to do? You want to share one or two that kind of stand out for you? Well, one that stands out. Oh, well, there's, there's quite a few actually. But uh, uh, I investigated a sighting, a face-to-face -face sighting by a couple of off-duty police officers, and this was in northeast Oklahoma, far northeast corner, in the river bottoms below the dam of Grand Lake, which is up in the which if you watched Bigfootville, we did some of the filming at that location with uh, those uh, two officers. And at that time, this would have been 2000, 2001, right in that area. Um, 
it had been 2000 maybe anyway 2000 2001 is over 20 years ago got an email uh, from one of those officers i'll use his name because his name was used in bigfootville dan belda uh, sent me an email telling about this encounter where him and this other off-duty officer of course the other officer was a, a sheriff's deputy and dan he was a, a city city cop that they had been <coughs> four-wheeling and camping down here in these river bottoms. They're yeah. very, very thickly wooded and a lot of tall hills. They'd drive their four, you know, like four-wheel drive vehicles over and such. And they had settled down for the night and they had a fire going and they were um, cooking their dinner and they could hear some. At the bottom of this big hill that come down behind them, there was like a dip and then a berm uh, that came up and they heard something in the leaves on the other side of that berm. And Dan told me, he said, I, we thought it was an armadillo uh, scooting through the leaves. So they thought, well, we're just going to walk around. One of them with a flashlight, they were going to shoot the armadillo. And when they went around the side of this berm, they seen that what they were hearing in the leaves, there was a Sasquatch that was laying on its belly on the other side of this berm, like it was trying to scoot up to the top of it where it could look over the top and see them. But as soon as they went around the side, it stood up just right in their face. And I asked Dan, I said, well, what, what did you guys do? And I'll, I'll clean up his response a little bit. But he basically said, he said, I screamed like a girl and ran. And his friend, his first name is Jeff. Um, he said, Jeff just froze. And he said, I grabbed him by the back of the collar and gave him a good jerk. And they, mm -hmm. they left. They left all their camping gear and stuff down there. And according to Dan, sent, sent a friend back for it the next day. Now, when I went up there um, to check this location out, Dan's friend Jeff would not go back down in there. And to my knowledge, when we shot those scenes for Bigfootville down there, that was the first time Jeff had returned uh, to those bottoms uh, since that incident, to my knowledge anyway. Now, Dan, he led me down in there to show me around the, uh, the area for quite a while. But before it got dark, he left. He wouldn't stay down there. So I, I camped down there uh, that night. Didn't didn't hear or see anything that first night. Now, after that, um, Dan stayed several nights when I'd come back up there to camp. Uh, I guess he saw nothing ate me or anything. So it was relatively safe, I guess. But it didn't make any um, aggressive moves toward them. They just heard it in the leaves, went around thinking it was something else. It stood up in their face. They ran off. And, and that was that. Uh, I don't have any doubt that those guys are telling the truth because they really didn't have anything to gain by going public with it, except, you know, ridicule from, from yeah. officers and stuff. And, uh, you know, Dan, he's, he's no longer with us. He passed away. Not, not too many years after that. But uh, I have, I have no doubt that uh, that they saw what they saw down there. Did did you put the? By the way, I was going to ask, did you put anything about the casino story in your book? I haven't had a chance to read oh, it. Oh yeah, I've got a, I've got a whole chapter on it. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah, uh, I've got a chapter on the casino footage. I've got a chapter that goes more in depth about um, the account of uh, the police officers. Um, I've, I've got a, so let's see what else, um, one that I, my most recent investigation of something very strange, uh, was down in Pushmataha County, uh, down close to a little town called Antlers. And that was a gentleman by the name of uh, Mark Copeland. And he had had some strange happenings going on on his property. Okay. Uh, down there. Have you heard of that at all? No. Okay, well, I got a chapter on it, and he had sent me an email, and I, I wasn't the first. He'd had other people uh, come and, and, and look as well. Uh, but basically, the way, and he sent me a pretty long email that his, uh, it kind of come to his knowledge because he had got his little boy, one of those little battery operated little Jeeps that you can sit in and drive. Yeah. Said the little boy made the comment when he got it was, well, he can't catch me now. And is and Mark's like, well, what are you talking about? He said, well, there's a, 
and he, he just described it as a big black man that was in the woods. And when he'd get off the school bus, it would pace him inside the edge of the tree line as he walked to the home. And then there was an incident later, a little boy come running in the living room and said there was a bear standing in his window looking in. And uh, then Mark, he set up some like security because I think that's what he did kind of for a living when he lived in Arkansas before he moved there uh, was a lot of electronic installations. So he set these cameras up around his house and he actually did pick up some like what looked like at the edge of the, the woods, uh, like these tall form, like a humanoid form standing inside the tree line, like watching the house. So I, I went out there and we walked around a lot of game trails out in those woods. And um, we found footprints in the leaves on there. And, and, and it looked like about three different size individuals. The, the most clear track that I found in the mud that had been rained on was not real big, but it's that wide, flat, you know, typical uh, Sasquatch footprint. I believe I've actually got a picture of it in my book uh, that I snapped uh, in there. And I, and we, yeah, I've got a picture of it. And it's got that, the big toe it kind of separated off to the side. It's like, it's, there's a picture of it in there. Um, now the other one that was the bigger tracks that were in the woods, it was in the leaf litter, which you don't, you don't get any detail on. I, I made a cast of one anyway, just because I'm like one, you know, I always throw it away if it's just terrible, but I've been to places where I found tracks that went like, now nah, I'm not going to mess with that and then wish I did later. And it, I think the biggest track was about 15 inches long. I did make a cast. Most pictures are in the book as well, but the bigger one's not real clear. You know, you get toe impressions and stuff with it. So, how would you describe the ge geography of Oklahoma and the area you live in? Is it heavily? Is it mountainous, hilly, forested? Heavily forested. See, I live um, uh, Hughes County, okay, which is just a little bit uh, east of what you'd call Central Oklahoma. Okay, like Ada, Oklahoma. Our university is called East Central. You go. Little bit found, I'm sitting right on top of Cola County. Now, most of the forest there here is it's very heavily wooded and it's more of a rolling type hills, not not as big a mountains as like the Kaimishi Mountains and the Washita Mountains and stuff. But it's as it goes further east, those kind of lower rolling hills with a lot of hardwoods start to give away to the steeper mountains of the, uh, you know, the, the Kaimishi Mountains and such and more pine trees. So I'm right on the edge. I mean, if you go about five miles south and east of my house, you run into the first pine forests. Now, where I'm at, it's mostly hardwoods. I'm sitting right on the edge of all that. Uh, the Kaimishi Mountains is about uh, the western edge of the Kaimishi Mountains. It's about a one-hour drive from my house, about 50, 60 miles. So, is, is the, Are there a lot of... Um streams and creeks and water features in Oklahoma, or is that a little more rare? No, it's, it depends on where. Oklahoma is a very diverse country. You go, uh, like, I, Interstate 35 splits Oklahoma in half, the east and okay, west. Yep. Okay, you go further west, it's a lot more arid. It turns into prairie. Uh, like the Wichita Mountains, which is the southwest part of the state, it looks more like what you'd find in New Mexico. Something oh, like that. So now, it's mainly it, the, it's so it's mainly the eastern part of Oklahoma that's yes eastern part. Forest. Now, the western okay. part has forest. Now the northwestern part is sure enough prairie, and you even run into mesas and stuff like that. But yeah, the eastern half is heavily wooded. Uh, the northeast, uh, central to the northeast, is mostly hardwoods. The southeast, a lot of pines and such like that. Now waterways, the eastern part of the state. I mean, you can throw a rock between the creeks pretty much. Okay. There's lots and lots of water. Yeah, because, you know, um, certainly getting pretty clear, you you don't have sightings unless you have water. They, You know, most sightings happen within 500 yards of water, some type of water feature. Yeah. Now, now I've got a friend down here that has a, 
uh, channel called Red Dirt Cryptid that's from the north northwest part of the state, and he investigates all kinds of cryptid stuff up there, and he's collected uh, more than a few, you know, Bigfoot sightings around that area. But that's like, you know, where the casino uh, thing is, just talking about water. Now, not far to the south of that, you've got you've got a river, like I believe it's the North Canadian River. Yeah. In the area where we found the tracks and stuff, which would be pretty much due west of the casino, there's a heavily wooded area that's not can't it's not really that big, but in this area there's a lot of like natural springs there. So you go in there, they're just loads of like deer. Yeah. You know, and stuff like that. So yeah, near the casino, there is water. But now generally in that area of the state, creeks and stuff are a lot fewer and far between. And unless there's just been a rain, they're generally dry. Yeah. Very interesting. Alex, do you have any I've been kind of hogging the conversation? Yeah. So as far as like stuff, you know, released to the public, why do you feel like you know, it just seems like still to this day, nothing beats the Patterson footage. That's a good question. Very good question. I don't know. But still, that's that's kind of the, the holy grail. I standard. Guess. Yeah, yeah, the holy what, grail. I mean, what would come close to that? The Freeman footage, maybe? Yeah. Um, and... A jillion blob squatches on Facebook. Now, you know, I mean, oh, come on. There's two jillion. Yeah. I mean, we know it's Bigfoot if it has a red circle around it stuff. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's not to say there's not a Bigfoot in there. You know, somebody might have. No, I think exactly. I always tell people, you know, it doesn't mean you didn't photograph something, but it doesn't have any scientific value well, at all. The thing on that. Now, I, I got a picture one time, and I, I do a lot of solo camping down and said the one the area that me and will will star actually went to and one night i was there and i was hearing something moving in the woods and it was getting close to dark and i had a little gopro i do use a gopro a lot out there and i just started snapping pictures of the woods okay when i got home i noticed a dark object kind of down there so i blew that up and i'll be darned if it didn't look like something's face peering out from behind a tree part of a body and the thing is the next sequence of it it looks like it moved and i i even showed it uh to some friends they're like dave you've got a sauce watch there i said it, it does look like it so what did i do very quickly as i can i went back to that area and found where that was it was not a sauce watch it was deeper in the woods and it was where a branch had been broken but it was behind this tree yeah through the brush, when you blew that up in a pixel, it did. If you, if you were sitting here with me and I was blowing that up for you, you would, if you didn't know the rest of the story, you'd think, man, that could be something. But I went back to that area quickly to see if I'd have got there and lined it up, it's like, that's not there anymore. That would still be suspicious. But I was my own killjoy on that. I went back and I found out what it was, mystery solved. Yeah. So that's what I try to encourage me. They, taking their blob squatch picture or whatever. And if it's a place that they're still have access to, and it's not been very long, go back and see if that's still there and, and such, you know, Let's see if you can identify it. Yeah. There, well, there's so many shadows and dark stumps and yes, things and true. tree branches. And, and, you know, the, <clears throat> like I tell everybody, I can find like 20 Bigfoots in my shower ceramic tile, well, you know, just, random shapes and and um it's just your our brains are just trained to spot eyes and a face we are designed to see faces in the clouds yeah. and trees whatever it's the pareidolia you know yeah pareidolia yeah yeah it's it's a common problem and people really need to fight it more and worse than that and right now it's still pretty easy to tell but as AI gets better, and it is, I mean, any given day of the week, you can open up Facebook and see an AI picture of Bigfoot. So this was taken from a camera, blah, blah, from 18, whatever. It's like, no, they didn't have pictures that clear back there. And that's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> but as it gets better, 
man, it's 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 already a whole new world. Well, basically, still pictures will be completely worthless very soon. They are now, um, but even video at some point will be pretty worthless unless there's some good um, vetting and context in the beginning and the middle and the end. You know, there's got to be context. It can't just can't just be footage. Yeah, because because even without AI, I mean, if you're you're dangerous in Photoshop, you can make some. Oh yeah, you know, it's, it's really. only going to get worse. You know, mm-hmm. it's only going to get worse. Now, when I first started, you know, looking into this stuff, like mid nineties and stuff, I could still once in a while find somebody who didn't know what a Bigfoot was. You'd be hard pressed right now, uh, but uh, like the area that that me and Will went to, the first time I went to that area. It was back in uh, 99 or 2000, right in there, uh, had got a report of, a, and this was secondhand through a neighbor of mine of where I live. It said a friend of theirs who breaks horses for a living had been in that area that I'm talking about and was riding his horse down one of these trails and a Sasquatch had stepped out in the trail, he said about 50 yards ahead of him, saw him on the horse and went back into the woods. and. That guy, I remember uh, I got my neighbor to take me to his house. He agreed to talk to me about it. And I remember him asking me, what are these things? Are they apes? And that that was his question, you know. And I, I go into detail in that chapter in my book as well. And he really didn't have any more, any preconceived uh, idea of what these were. And that, that led, I went back into that area uh, many times, still do, you know. So, um, is there a certain season that there's more activity that you've noticed in Oklahoma? I would think it would be more towards, you know, the colder weather, but well, isn't, I, isn't, isn't the weather pretty mild there? Uh, it either is or it's extreme. I mean, Oklahoma's crazy like that. Well, like, you don't get I, below zero, do you? Oh, yeah. You do? Absolutely. Huh. Yeah, we had like uh, last winter, like uh, Two weeks solid, it didn't get out and get above. Really? So you had, had, so you've had, I didn't even know you really had much snow there, but you've had below zero weather there. All, every, oh, every geez, year. Oh, that's crazy. And we don't have, it's usually not for a long time. Wow. Uh, now, I remember, now, it's, here's the, what's changed. When I was a kid, it would snow a lot in the winter. We would have sometimes snow with, you know, three or four foot, you know, drifts and stuff. But now we get more ice. Wow. So like uh, last uh, last winter, uh, man, we had like uh, like two weeks straight that it was below zero every day. Really? Now, as far as uh, to your question, though, uh, most of the sightings that I have looked into have been in the, either the spring or the fall. OK. Now, but the question comes up, is that because they're on the move more during that time or is it yeah. because that's when more people are out in the woods to see. Them. Yeah, and that's that's the whole confusing issue. We don't know, but now, it's still a valid question. You know, it's a I, good theory. You know what I do believe, uh, and I think evidence points to this. I do not think that they habituate in one particular area for very long, because the reason I say that. If any animal of any size stays in a concentrated area for very long at all, they're going to leave mouths of evidence. Yeah. You know, the evidence that I find seems to point towards a smaller population that's nomadic in maybe a mountain range or something like that, where they'll visit a place and go on. And it may be the case like, you know, you may get an area where there's a lot of sightings going on for a while. And then before you know it, Everybody's going there looking for Bigfoot, and then nobody sees them. So I think that the more people that intrude, maybe they move on quicker to somewhere yeah. else. Yeah, that could be. There's such a, I mean, there's so many factors that they're very tough to pin down any kind of patterns. Um, and then, you know, you, know you, can, you get 20 sightings in an area. could just be one animal. Yeah, that could be. I mean, there, you know, there has to be a, a, a breeding population. Uh, sure, well, of course. Unless, you know, uh, and I know there's there's one uh, one camp of these that, you know, looks at these creatures as a, a supernatural, uh, you know, type entity. 
And of course, if it was something like that, I guess that would, you know, all bets are off the table, you know. And so like do you have any, well, <laughs> do you have any other pet theories, David? And you know, stuff uh, you want to get off well, your chest? Oh, well, sure. I mean, and, and I go in. I make a chapter on this in the book. Uh, you know, back in the and and you know this. I mean, back in the nineties and stuff, the the uh, people in the scientific community that would actually throw their hat in the ring in it, they were looking at it as kind of a descendant of perhaps, you know, Gigantopithecus. Um, like I know Jeff Meldrum, you know, pretty much did. John Bendernagel, which I had a good visit with him back, gosh, 20 years ago at the first Texas Bigfoot deal. Very, very nice gentleman. Um, now, my theories are more what I don't think they are than what I think they are. Personally, and this, and I say this with all due respect to you know the anthropologists or primatologists that they're looking for a Gigantopithecus. My question, and and I and I mentioned this to John Bendernagel back that time long ago. So why would a giant ape, which from what little in the fossil record that we know of it is closer to an orangutan, what would have caused it to leave an area where its native food was make that huge hike over the Bering Strait into a strange land where none of its original food sources would be. And while it's walking, I mean, we're, we're all familiar with what an ape's foot looks like. It's, it's made for climbing, for gripping. It's not, it's not for bipedal walking. And all that time as it's walking, it's quickly evolving from that into a more human uh, type gait. And, that's that's what puzzles me and and makes me not really lean toward the Gigantopithecus thing. Now, on the other side of that, um, many of the like native legends, especially up in the Pacific Northwest, seems like they're describing uh, another type of human, like a hairy giant human that lives yeah. up in the mountains. And if we go to some of the stories uh, where Indian maidens native maidens were occasionally abducted and even you know produced a child with these they would have to be very closely related to us if those stories are true so my own thoughts is i think they would have to be closer related to us and to be of a high enough intelligence to know that prolonged contact with us is not their best interest yeah and still be smart enough to avoid us as much as they have. That's just me thinking out loud. Any other any other theories on food that they eat? Um, do you think they're meat eaters, omnivorous, just uh, plant eaters? What What are your thoughts there? Well, I'll, I'm, I'm leaning toward it omnivorous. I would think yeah. they would have to take advantage of what's available. And, you know, there's loads of stories in the past of them, you know, taking a deer and eating plants is, is you know, just like that. But, I mean, what is it like a black bear? Similar size, you know, and it probably has uh, similar requirements to live out in the out in the wild and stuff. But uh, I would say they would take advantage of whatever food source was available. Interesting. By the way, Julie Wheeler just said that... Um, she just listened to the Sasquatch Chronicles, and I've listened to that too. It is kind of a terrifying story. So, David, you you've been down. You're downplaying that story a bit. No, I'm just telling. I've never heard anything about chickens. Oh anything. well, and I've never heard if she's talking about Honubby. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I, I don't know. I mean, I know I know Judy, uh, but I. The only thing that I'd ever heard about it was that the meat was in the freezer. Yeah. And I'd never heard anything about. Well, there's a, if you go to Sasquatch Chronicles, there's a really amazing show on it. Okay. Wes did a, he did an interview with the brothers or brother. And um, that sounded pretty terrifying. I mean, they were oh, yeah, definitely, they were scared day after day. So, yeah. It was an ongoing problem. So, there you go. Thanks, Judy, for your comment. So, um, 
what's the best evidence that you've collected or seen like hard evidence as far as that i would say the casino footage is okay. convincing yeah that was that was definitely a turning point for you it sounds like oh that that definitely was yeah. that definitely was uh, that actually almost uh I would say there for a pretty brief period of time, I was pretty manic about going out looking, looking for these things, you know, like every, it was actually taking up every spare moment of my time. Wow. Because I was just like, you know, now if what had stepped under that light, we went out and measured it up and it turned out to be five foot something, that might've been a different story. But you know, when something's a little over nine feet tall, that's and what did it step under again explain that in more detail so everybody hears the details well you had the grease trap there right right and as you could see i hope you could there, there's that light pole right beside yeah. it it was coming on the the side of the light pole it, it, it was in front of the light pole it came from up here and walked like you had the grease trap here and it stepped up to the grease trap and kind of leaned over toward it. And that's as much of it as we saw. Okay. And you did you ask them whether they had it feeding in the in the grease? They didn't tell us that. No. They didn't tell you that. It was uh, you now if I can find it, I've got a picture at home somewhere of a like the fingers of it on top of that lid, and they were very wide. Oh, so it left fingerprints too. Right. The lid. right. And what 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 color were the fingerprints? Well, it was just pressed into the grease. I mean, it was a dirty. Thing. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, I, of course, if you know Alton, you could ask him about this. But I want to say he saw fingerprints on the side of a car or something uh, there at a later date. Mm. Fingerprints. Yeah. yeah. Now, now when I say finger, I don't mean the fingertip. I mean the whole like the whole. You can uh, see the the fingers from like here up. You know, on top of mm. it. Um, that would that might it was either Roger or Alton. One of them two had said they'd found you know prints there. That would have been after after I was there. So How many of these things, David, do you think there are in North America? What's your guess and why? Oh, man. <laughs> I don't. Oh, I don't. That's a tough one. but That is a tough one. And I don't, especially now, I do not think you can go off of the number of sightings because it's got to the point where uh, my friend, friend of mine, Cornell, um, uh, has the deal called the No Such Thing podcast. He said, if there was as many of them out there as people were reporting and we couldn't drive without running over one on the highway, you know. But uh, if I was to guess Oklahoma, let's see, three population, southeast Oklahoma, northeast Oklahoma, a couple hundred maybe, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. That's and again, I mean. I, I well, let's say okay. So you have two hundred in in Oklahoma total, but you've got fifty states, but only half the states probably have a, you know, are wet enough and have good habitat enough. Yeah. So if you took it times half the amount, you'd have four thousand animals in probably all of North America. Does that sound like <clears throat> too many to you? Probably. I mean, I mean it just that's... seems like if there was that many, that there would be a lot more solid side. But again, I mean, I've, I've got no way to make an educated guess on that. Yeah. No, I don't either. What was the what was the BFRO conjecture on that? I, I thought somebody on that. I think had... Matt's always kind of been around 4,000 in North yeah. America. But um, uh, Will Star down there saying 10,000 total in North America, in my opinion. Yeah, he could be right too. Sure. And, and you know, and who knows? Could be two thousand. Could be ten thousand. I would say the range. It couldn't be any less than two. Or it's just, a really uh, huge mass delusion, and there's zero. Yeah. Which I don't think that. I know. Uh, 
you know, I mean, well, we know, you know, people report seeing them and I've, and I've taken reports that I'm pretty sure is mistaken identity, you know, but even if you take out the mistaken identity and the hoaxes, there's still those that I can't think of any other thing it could be. Yeah. What, what percentage do you think are potentially you feel are very legitimate if after taking out the hoax? Yeah. And then second part to Alex's question is how many, what percentage do people even report these damn sightings? That's good. That's good. That's yeah. Second part. That, that's too. Cause I know that um, I have people still contact me once in a while just here at the store that, you know, tell me about, you know, sightings that they've had that they've never told anyone just because they didn't want to get ribbed about it. And I've taken many that people say just this is for your, you know, your own data, and but I'd rather you not share it with anyone, and I don't. You know, so, yeah, there there is that. Um, there is that aspect, too, the people that just don't don't tell anybody. What uh, is there anything, David, that you feel like, like, what's the most controversial thing you believe about Bigfoot or have a, you know, a theory about the most controversial theory about them? Yeah. Yep. That's what he said, David. Controversy. Okay. Well, probably <laughs> in my opinion, and, and of course, my gosh, all these people are dying. I mean, what's the deal with? Yeah, there you're right. And, There's uh, a lot of, um, you know, uh, and, and we I've just had, lost Joe Schneider. And, yeah, Joe and Joe was a friend of mine. My gosh, I've been on his podcast and, you know, talked to him, just a nice person. Makes me think I might want to reconsider what I'm doing. I don't know. But, but no, uh, probably the most controversial to me would be uh, Scott Carpenter's theory about them being uh, the remnants of the Nephilim from Genesis chapter 6. Mm -hmm. And I am theologically educated, for lack of a better word, and I... You know, and I include, I've got a chapter in my book called What Are They, in which I throw some of these opinions out there. And I called Scott up on the phone, and he was gracious enough to talk to me about why he thought that. And Scott, he was a, you know, a Southern evangelical Christian, and he uh, tended to, you know, try to tie the things into biblical things. And he, sure. uh, and of course, I read. And also, Scott, when I read Genesis chapter 6, it said, you know, the sons of God came into the daughters of men and, you know, had children with them. And these were the mighty men of old, the men of renown. Okay, I said, so how did these mighty men of old, these men of renown, which when I'm reading the different mythologies, uh, I, I'm thinking the Nephilim were basically what in Greek mythology would have been Hercules and some of the other demigods and such as that. And I said, unless these are the the inbred, downgraded versions of that, and that's kind of what he thought, you know, they they might be. And like I said he shared his opinion. But to me, that's the most controversial, simply because, in my opinion, I just don't think that's feasible. And that's not being disrespectful towards anybody that does think that. That's just my thoughts. Yeah. Uh, the other more controversial. Um, and uh, is, uh, you know, Ron Moorhead, which I had Ron, he was on my podcast one time, and he's leaned pretty heavy toward them being kind of an interdimensional, or at least capable, yep. you know, of those things. And, and one thing I told Ron, I said, man, whether somebody agrees with you or not, you've definitely done your homework, <laughs> you know. Um, but I, th I think those, as far as what I am, have come across are the two what you know some people would consider controversial the whole the whole nephilim thing and of course the nephilim thing that's even spread to pretty much everything from sasquatch to dog people to you know any number of things yeah so, and then of course you can you can plug them into the mormon religion too my brother was a my older brother was a researcher and um he was he converted to Mormonism because I believe he had a really good sighting really? face to face when he used to go and do these wilderness survival camp. Um, you know, he would he would just go with a knife and a rope, no flashlight, and head into the north woods and be gone wow. for a week. So, so he was serious. Oh, big time! And then he 
he came back out of the woods one day and his, he was a totally different guy. And he sold everything and he he moved to um, Wisconsin to the, actually on Bray Road to Burlington area where he found um, a church that he joined, a Mormon church, and converted to being a Mormon based because, on what he saw, I believe. Because of what he encountered in the woods. Yeah. You know, you say that, and I remember years ago, this would have been back in the 90s, I read a story, and I don't know if this was supposed to have been uh, put out as just a story or as a truth, but this guy was talking about, and he was a Mormon uh, elder or, you know, whatever they called their uh, their uh, leadership, having an encounter with the Bigfoot when he was riding a horse and him kind of rebuking it and, mm -hmm. and it going away. And yeah. do you know that story? Is that familiar to you? Yeah, well, I believe that's the story that my brother latched onto. Okay. So, and I don't yeah. know if that was supposed to be just a story or the, it was the retelling of something that was supposed to have been a happening. And, uh, yeah, like uh, something to do with Cain or, I yeah, really don't know. I'm not Mormon, so I don't know. Right. Well, the mark of Cain, that's a, in the, the thing with that again is how would the mark of Cain have survived the biblical flood? If you're going along with scripture, yeah. you know, for that, I mean, if you're, not a believer in that then it, it's null and void anyway but um uh, there's the whole issue of that that Noah and his immediate family was the only ones to survive the the flood so where would the mark of cain fit in after that and i've also heard growing up and i'm sure in your uh, i'm not saying you're older than me but we're at least in the in the realm of <laughs> the age or whatever growing up there's even some people down here in the south that thought that the mark of cain was a racial thing and i always even as a kid thought well that's that's kind of the main thing to to say you know but uh, who knows i mean all i know is i remember one day my brother's daughter was over saw a legend Mead science poster mm -hmm. and said oh my dad was you know, I was really into that, and I didn't even know that. But I had suspected that's why he moved to Wisconsin because he literally came out of the woods. Wow! And um, he all he would admit to was he saw something dark hmm. in the forest, face to face. He would never tell us what it was, and he never did. Never did. No, he yeah. never did. But boy, he's skedaddled out there. And I mean, you know, when you go and sell your house and you sell everything and you move, I mean, you're suddenly your life is taking a right, right angle turn. And then the fact that he joined, he joined up with the BFRO um, and was, uh, you know, a lurker in all these forums and he was looking for answers. So what, you know, and for me not to know about it and I was into it, but for a whole different reason, it's kind of weird. It's kind of a weird story. But I remember I got off the phone one time with Lauren Coleman and he goes, Oh, I just got off the phone with your brother. Wow. I'm like, what? How do you know my brother? He goes, Oh, well, I interviewed him for some the Mormon, something to do with Bigfoot and Mormonism or something. I don't know. I haven't read that book yet, and I probably should get a copy of it. Mm -hmm. But my brother's passed on, so oh, okay. kind of let sleeping dogs lie, if you know what I mean. Yeah, that that is that is interesting, though. I mean, yeah. something to have. You know, I've I've mm -hmm. talked to people in the past that have reportedly seen a Sasquatch, and it was at a distance, and I thought, wow, that that was pretty neat. That was I just can't believe I seen it. And then somebody else, it's like. Uh, they move. They want nothing else to do with it, you know. Yeah. Like uh, Mark Copeland that I was talking about earlier, he, him and his family moved back to Arkansas. And I said, he, I think he made a comment on a post he did on Facebook a while back, said, I have so many number of problems in Arkansas, but not a one of them is Bigfoot. <laughs> you know? So, uh, yeah, he, he didn't want nothing else to do with it, you know. Now, you want to know more on that story? Uh, uh, Bigfoot Odyssey. You know they uh, they come up there and uh, 
Kerry Arnold uh, did a documentary at Mark's place, and I, I'm on part of that. And Kerry did a phenomenal job of interviewing him about all the goings on there. Interesting. And he did, and you can still you can watch that. It's on on the Odyssey website. Of course, we know mm -hmm. Kerry. He died last year. Yeah, of course, we lost Kerry too. Yeah. yeah. And I talked to him the night before. I was on the I was up in the Washita Mountains, and I was high enough. I had a phone signal, and he uh, contacted me about doing his show that night. I said, well, I'm up in the mountains. He goes, well, tell me about it when you get back. And then when I get home, I got a message from somebody that uh, tell me how bad they felt for the family. And I'm like, well, what happened? You know, and I still got on the text. I texted Carrie. I said, man, is everything all right? And it's like, no, he died in a car wreck. Yeah. We, we just never know, man. No, you don't. Um, but, yeah, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of people... Uh, it's and we probably came close to losing Jeff Meldrum here recently. Wait, do what now? Jeff Meldrum was sick. Oh yeah, I knew that. I thought you surely not him too. No, 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 no. no he's no. he's doing good, but we we <laughs> we were worried about him. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, but could you imagine being okay? Picture being in the Northwoods of you know around the Canadian border. He never built a fire when he went, ever. Just he never brought matches, nothing. Knife and a rope and topography maps. One square mile topography maps. And he would go for a week at a time. No tent, no nothing. No sleeping bag, nothing. And could you imagine having an encounter in that situation at night? That would be a little, a little scary. <laughs> I'm, I'm still, I just can't imagine. And I consider myself a pretty decent outdoorsman, but I mean, I go with gear, you know, I carry oh, yeah. sidearm. Now I carry a sidearm, not in people have got the wrong ideas. Like you carry a sidearm. What, how big a caliber do you carry? I said, that's a 40 caliber, but I was a police officer for a while. And that's the, the weapon I carried when I was on duty. And, um, they said, well, that wouldn't stop a Sasquatch. I said, I'm not carrying it for that. But out there in the woods like that, it's, it's, you know, you've got wild pigs are probably the most dangerous thing down there. And there's abundance, but it's more for, you know, bad people coming up and trying to, you know, with a criminal right. element coming up. That's the thing. I've had some tweakers roll up to my camp before and just stared, you know, kind of sizing me up. They saw I was armed. They found somewhere else to go. Yeah. But no, it's, uh, from my experience uh, and reports I've taken and things like that, if a Bigfoot was really out to get you, you probably wouldn't know it till it was too late. Yeah, you would think. Out. You would think you would just get dragged off quick. I don't think you have time to react. The area where, where Will was telling you, the, the rock that was tossed in our camp, it, it wasn't big. Now, the first rock throwing incident in that area that I experienced, and this, I, there's a witness, there's a friend of mine with me. Uh, we were investigating uh, the sighting by the gentleman on horseback. And after midnight that night, it was drizzling rain, a loud, loud crash woke us up right at the edge of camp. Something had thrown a rock against a large tree at the edge of our camp. This rock's like 25, 30 pounds. Mm -hmm. And just bam. You know, we, we didn't go to sleep the rest of the night, but people say, yeah, that was aggression. I said, uh, not necessarily. I said, aggression would have been dropping that rock on the top of us. Yeah. Um, if I'm getting an impression, it was something was letting us know it was there and it would rather us not be. But um, that's the uh, first time of any type of rock throwing incident. And that was a big enough rock that, I mean, a person could not have thrown a rock with that much force of that size. I mean, I could pick it up and move it. You can see where it dented the tree about five foot off the ground, you know, and I'm like, what, what does that leave? Yeah, it's true. And it was in the location where the gentleman had, had uh, reportedly saw this Sasquatch step out in the road ahead of him and run back into the trees, you know? So, Interesting. So um, I see you have a lot of good reviews on your book. Um, 
and I know you've written other books. What what what's the title of another? You wrote another big book, uh, book, didn't you, well, too, David? This is the first book I wrote, and this is this is a fictional. There you go, the champagne. It's a fictional story uh, based uh, on the champagne. Now, I was uh, talking to uh, uh, my friend there, uh, Tim Harjo, who's on Bigfootville with me. I said, okay, I want to write a book about uh, Bigfoot, but a mean one. Okay, I said, in, in Choctaw, and I wanted to place the story in the far southeast Oklahoma, which is Choctaw Territory. And I've had people here, we're in Chickasaw Nation, where I'm at. Why didn't you write it about the uh, the Chickasaw version, which is like a, a Lufa or something like that? I can't, Lufa, or it's, it starts with an L. Then I said, well, because the Washita Mountains is Choctaw Nation, and I want to deal with that. So the Champe in a Choctaw folklore, which that would have gone all the way back to what's Mississippi now, um, it's described as like a big black ogre-like monster that lived out there and it would hunt down a person and eat it. And the only way you had to get away from it is if you had killed the game, maybe throw down the game. Maybe. And it had an extremely foul odor and all that. I'm like, well, that's describing a Sasquatch kind of. So I, I used that and I ran with that uh, in the story. Uh, now, in the story, there is a fictional... Uh, Bigfoot uh, researcher that gets called in on these missing persons uh, reports that are coming in from that area. And he is going in his mind about what he thinks of the Sasquatch and this and that. And lo and behold, his opinions on what a Sasquatch might be kind of correspond with mine. So <laughs> on that, so uh, I, I go into a lot of that. I like the, I like the cover. It's pretty cool. Well, we are uh, about, we are out of time. David, yeah. it was a pleasure, and I would imagine they get your book on Amazon. Yeah, Do you have a website that they can go to? Uh, yeah. Well, just go to Amazon, type in books by David Wilbanks. And it'll okay. Be my Amazon page, that both are available. Or just type in the Champagne or type in Kaimishi Bigfoot. Funny thing about Kaimishi Bigfoot, when it first came out, if, before people started buying it, if you topped in Kayamishi Bigfoot, it would pull up recipes for kimchi, which is a Korean oh, no. dish, you know. Oh, and yeah. my wife is from South Korea, and she thought that was quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But now if you top in Kayamishi Bigfoot, that's what comes in. Gotcha. And, uh, and the champagne is uh, <clears throat> uh, there as well. So Yeah, his book is not about cabbage. I know <laughs> it's not. But, um, but yeah, they're both available there. And if you're in Ada, Oklahoma, you can come by my store and pick one up in person. And wow. I've had people do that. What, what's the name of your music store? My music store is called Dave's Music. And Boy, I, that's an original name, yeah, Dave. Yeah. And a uh, uh, funny story, when I first opened, I was putting in an order and they were not they were not shipping me my stuff. I said, why are you not shipping my me my guitars? They said, well, when you pay your past due bill, we'll send it. I'm like... I just opened. I have no bills at all yet. And they called back and apologized. I said, oh, my gosh, there's a Dave's Music down in Brownsville, Texas. And we were. Oh, <laughs> so, well, well, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to open a I'm going to open a music shop right next to you called Doug's Music. <laughs> well, you bought to pick a bigger town. This is a pretty small town. But no, I've been open since 1992. This is my oh, first cool. year. So Congrats. sounds have, like a fun business. Uh, I have people come in here to buy guitars. I have people come in from all over and tell me their Bigfoot story or, you know, such as that, you know. So no, that's, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Do you, do you speak at conferences, too, uh, around the country? Or? I, not around the country. I had, The first one I spoke at was last year, and that was at the Honubby Conference. Mm. And they'd been after me for a couple of years, but I'm like, yeah, I don't really want to. But by that by last year, I'd had both of my books written. They said, look, we pay a little bit and you can sell your books. I said, okay. And I ended up having a really good time. Met met some nice people. Met Shelly Covington, Montana, actually. Oh, yeah. Some of the other speakers. All the speakers were in the same cabin. So I got to visit her, Pete Buffalo Head, and, and, and some others and stuff. And, and just had a great time. This year, I spoke there again. I spoke in Lauren Coleman's place 
last year at the Texas Bigfoot Conference in Jefferson. Uh, I was going to go down there and set up a booth and and um, uh, Craig Woolheater puts it on and said, hey, if you'll speak for 30 minutes, we won't charge you for your booth. I said, oh, OK, that's fine. I can do that. And what I didn't know was the head. I'll say the headline, I guess. And of course, Lyle Blackburn, friend of mine, he spoke before I did. And I was spoke after him and that was supposed to be Lauren Coleman speaking there. So when I got up there, I said, well, I'm fall, I'm talking after Lyle Blackburn and in Lauren Coleman's spot. So I guess I shouldn't feel any pressure, huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, it, but it was all good. It was a lot of fun. Oh, those are the only two conferences that I've spoke at. Um, I have spoke a couple of times. There's a Bigfoot museum in Tallahena. And I've done a couple of uh, book signings there, one with another author, local author named John Vandeventer, who's a very good writer, by the way. Um, I've done that twice. But as far as conferences, Honubby and Jefferson's the only ones I've done. Interesting. Uh, Judy says you need to get up to speed on Honubby. You need to listen to that Wes Germer interview. Oh, I might do it. I mean, it's... That's, that's older history now, but no, I know most of what I talked about is, I mean, the casino footage was a long time ago. Yeah. Well, let's, um, once again, put the word out. Let's, uh, God, I'd be willing to definitely, we could afford some money for that footage. I'd love to get that out. I, w I would love to see it again. Yeah. You know, and, and I don't think time has, dulled my perception because like i said i've heard you know rogers interviews and stuff and he describes the same thing that i remember so i you know it's a tall lanky nine foot plus tall thing stepping up there to the grease trap you know yeah. I just, there's no other way to spin that well we'll figure we'll figure it out by the way um ristol asked about adam colt adam's going to be on next Wednesday, right? Alex? Yeah. Adam yeah, Cole will week. be on next Wednesday. Yeah. And we also have a surprise guest next Wednesday. So with that, thank you so much, David. Buy yeah. David's books. Yes. Um, and we will see everybody. God bless. And we'll see everybody next week. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks for inviting me on, guys. Thank, thanks, David. I call you up in the middle of the night. Been bothered by dreams, ain't feeling alright You give me comfort, say just give it some time By the end of our talk, I'm feeling just 